All right, like he said, my name is Clay Brewer. I'm with uh, Stay Tough Fence Company. We're based out of New Brunswick, Texas. Um, we specialize, I guess, in a high tensile fixed knot fence originated in the, in the deer farming industry uh, a long time ago and kind of drifted down into uh, normal agriculture, cows, uh, horses, stuff like that. Uh, in your binders here, you'll see a, there's a little pamphlet that has all our different products, wires, tools, and stuff. Most all that, uh, most any tools and stuff you see today or, or products that we use today on my demo will be in that pamphlet. So we'll get started. Like he said, they started these fence schools um, several years ago in Virginia, and then when Mr. Chris moved to Kentucky, we started them here. Uh, We've got two two scheduled. We had four, and obviously COVID, we had to cancel some. So so today we're here in Glasgow. So what, we'll start. Why do you need fencing? Um, is it to replace an old fence, or have you have you bought a new piece of property and you know and you're you're starting from scratch? All right. The next thing that you need to think about when you're fencing: what are we trying to do with the fence? Are we trying to contain something, or are we trying to keep something out? Uh, that that makes a big difference on how you're going to install a fence, what pattern of wire you, you may choose, um, and some other things. Consider all your options. Uh, we're real big on, on laying out and preparing it ahead of time. Um, draw it out on paper. Uh, find out where you need your gate, your waters. Uh, what are you going to do with the fence? Are you using it as a wing uh, for a catch pin? Is it a perimeter? Uh, you know, there's several different things you need to consider. Um, are you trying to keep something in, like I talked about, or are you trying to keep something out? Small ruminant uh, sheep and goat farms are really becoming big nowadays. We're going to be on one today, and a lot of times predator control is a big issue on, on a farm like that. So uh, several things to keep in mind when you're preparing and trying to decide what kind of wire or what type of pattern of wire you want to install. Uh, also, know your property. Uh, we were at a fence school Monday and Tuesday, a little rougher terrain than we're going to be on today, and we ran into some rock and some other things that we weren't counting on. Um, we actually hit a utility line, a gas line, so always call your 811. Even though they had it marked, it was not where they had it marked. So, so, so know your property. Um, go around it, walk around it, call, do the 811s. That way, if you do have issues, it, it is... Uh, covered. All right, we always like to try to start with a clean fence. If, if you're on your, you know, on an existing property, an updated survey is always a good idea. Um, also a pretty good idea to try your best, if you can, to take a tractor or a bulldozer or something. Clean your area out. As you'll see today, uh, fencing is not difficult, but it's a whole lot easier to do it properly and, and in a timely manner if you're not having to work around old fences growed up trees, stuff like that. Uh, this is a, an area here, actually this is a farm I own. We, you can see here this was a woods and we just took a dozer and pushed us out of about a 20 or 30 foot swath where we could get our equipment in and out, made it very easy to install a new fence here. All right, use survey flags and paint guns to lay it out. Um, you'll see we yesterday we used flags. Uh, we didn't use any paint guns yesterday. We had enough hands we could help, but we're going to talk here in a minute about driving post. It's, it's a whole lot easier to take those flags up and move them and kind of lay everything out with flags and paint than it is to just say, oh, I'm going to put a post here. And then, boy, I wish I had done that different. So, so take your time, prepare, um, you know, draw it out on paper, set it up. You, you can change things a whole lot easier that way. Select the proper fence fabric. All right. This is a big deal here. A lot of people, um, if you haven't put up fence in a long time or if you're not real familiar with, with woven wire or fixed knot style fences, uh, everybody thinks it's all just you know one size fits all. That, that's very incorrect. They, we make several, several different patterns of wire. So we go back to the thing we're talking about. What are you trying to do with your fence? Are you trying to keep something in or out? Are you trying to keep in horses, goats, cows, pigs? What are you, what are you trying to do? So. Um, that's a big thing we're going to touch on in here in a minute. Um, 
fence stays, vertical stays, we'll go over that. Uh, depending on what you're doing with it, you may need them closer together, or if, or if it's a perimeter style fence, you can go further apart. Um, this is some fence fa fabric numbers. Um, today, we're actually going to be using a different wire. This is the fence fabric that we put up uh, Tuesday. These are stay tough numbers. Um, any roll of fixed knot or woven wire that you can buy on the market probably somewhere has some type of sequence of numbers. This is how we label each uh, roll of fabric to tell you what it is because in a roll sitting on the store shelf or whatever, it's very hard to tell what that fabric actually is. So we use these numbers so you know what you're getting. In our numbers, the first set of numbers is the number of horizontal line wires and the height of the fence. So in this case, we have nine horizontal lines and the height of that roll of wire is 49 inches tall. The second series of numbers is the spacing in between the vertical stays. This is a, a, big, a big deal here because if it's a perimeter fence, you need to save a little money like all farmers do. I, I'm one too. Any, anywhere you can pinch a penny is good. So if it's a perimeter fence, something like that, you can go with a 12-inch stay. We used to make a 24-inch stay. We don't much anymore just because a, a cow sometimes can get her head through it. But if you're using your fence that you're installing at in a higher pressure situation, if, you, uh, you know, if you're building a catch pen out of it, a crowding area, you may want to go back to a six inch stay or even maybe a possibly a three inch stay. We make anything from two inch to 12 inch. Um, we make, you know, a lot, of, a lot of our horse fence will be a, a two inch stay to keep, keep an animal from getting his hoof through it or something like that. And then the last series of numbers is simply the, the amount of feet on the roll. We make rolls anywhere from 100 feet to 660 foot, depending on what pattern you get. We don't make all patterns in, in all roll lengths due to weight and size and a couple other things. But um, that's just some different numbers. Today we're going to be using a 134812. Um, 1348 seems to be a very popular wire for the small ruminant, the goats, stuff like that. It's very graduated, really tight uh, horizontal line wires at the bottom, as you'll see today when we install it. Uh, we're actually using 1348-12. It's more of a perimeter fence. There'll be a little pressure down the lane, but not a whole lot of pressure, so not a whole lot of need for a for a six-inch stay there. So. Um, and then it'll be a 330 foot roll instead of a 500. This is a label right off a roll of our wire. This is a cattle tough roll here, 949, 12, 660. That's, that's basically the wire we used earlier this week. But, but as you can see, it's right in the top corner. That, that's a square label, be right on the front of the roll so you can look at those numbers and know exactly what pattern that, you, that you're getting. Uh, here's just another example, there it is. All right, I said earlier that, that we specialize in a high tensile fixed knot fence. High tensile is probably not new to the market nowadays, uh, four, five, six, maybe 10 years ago it was. Uh, now, nowadays people have heard of high tensile, but a lot of people don't know the difference in high tensile and, and a traditional low carbon fence. Uh, some key differences, lower installation cost um, and a whole lot more memory in your wire. Also a little, uh, a lot less stretch and greater breaking strength. Whether you use Stay Tough wire or some other product, some other uh, company, we want to try to persuade y'all, I guess, to stay with a high tensile wire. Uh, low carbon wires, some, some older brands that have red tops on them that, that y'all have seen in the past that maybe your grandfather or somebody used. We're good in their day, but that's a low carbon wire. Everything is a whole lot more advanced nowadays. Um, and you'll see today there's, there's many reasons why we want to try to stay away from low carbon wire, whether it be bob wire or a, or a hinge joint woven wire type of fence. Uh, some, some, some key differences, um, low carbon wire, it's going to have about 0.28 carbon content. High tensile wire is going to have 0.64, so more than double the carbon content, which makes a, a harder wire, and it raises your breaking strength a whole lot more. As you can see here, it's uh, 
you know, almost three times the breaking strength as a, a 12 and a half gauge low carbon wire is going to break about 560 pounds or so. 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire is going to break around 14, 1500 pounds. So a major difference there, big, big difference. Um, lower installation cost, that, that's, that's a big key because like everybody here, I'm sure I, I, I'm the same way. I want to put up fence one time and I want, I want to be done and I want it to be effective and a strong fence, but I want it to be as cheap as possible in, in some cases too. So high tensile wire is going to allow you to have a lower installation cost. Um, with like a traditional five strand bob wire fence, uh, which is still very common today, a lot of people think, man, I'm just gonna put up bob wire and save the money and be done with it. Uh, if, if you have not researched properly and, and you don't really look at all the different aspects of installing a fence, a lot of times you can go wrong and, and put up a fence that costs you more even though you're trying to save money. Uh, in a low carbon fence, whether it be five strand bob wire or a hinge joint, you're going to need a brace assembly every 330 foot, so basically every roll. Uh, line posts are going to have to be on 8 to 10 foot centers, uh, you know, and if you're installing bob wire, you may have four or five separate pulls. With a high tensile type fence, whether it be a fixed knot fence like I'm going to install or an electric fence like Jeremy's going to install, um, big time money savings. You, you, you can space your line post up to 25 foot apart, uh, depending on the terrain. Around here is kind of hilly to rolling, so you, you may not be able to get away with 25 foot centers every time, but 15 is pretty common. Uh, you can use 15 foot on, on pretty hilly terrain. To, that's about what we're on out here, even though it was a, a very flat farm that you'll see today. He, he wanted to stay around 15 foot, and I think that's, that's pretty close to what we were. You only need a, a brace assembly every 1,320 foot on a, on a fixed knot fence or a, or a smooth wire fence, which is basically every four rolls. So you have cut three brace assemblies out. Um, so even though the roll of wire may be a little higher, your cost per foot of fence is steadily going down if you're using high tensile because of those three main things right there. And also, uh, you know, a fixed knot fence is a one pool installation, which uh, that could be with hinge joint too but but the big keys here to take away are a whole lot less braces and you can space your line post apart which which really creates some savings all right I took these numbers I, I went to local tractor supplies uh, not in this town but in another town in Kentucky and I, and I took the price of T-Post their bob wire that they carried which is a low carbon 12 and a half gauge four point bob wire um, made by one of our competitors that, that everybody is aware of. They've been around a long time. And then I also uh, took prices on the next comparison of a hinge joint fence, a, tip, uh, a typical 1047 uh, roll of hinge joint, which is probably the most common fence that used to be used anywhere if you used a woven wire type of fence. So let's do some comparison. This is a... Uh, on a thousand foot straight run, just, just imagine a, a field with a thousand feet uh, in, in a straight line. And so we're going to compare two or three different types of fence options and, and kind of put it into perspective so you can kind of see what, what we're talking about when we say the roll might cost a little more, but your cost per foot of fence may be cheaper. All right, so if we're going to put up a five strand bob wire fence with traditional low carbon wire like a lot of people still do today and, and that like they used to do all the time. We're gonna need four brace assemblies every 330 foot, so roughly $200 worth of post and brace pins. We're gonna need roughly 100 T post at about $4, so $400. Five rolls of low carbon barbed wire at $73, and that number, those T post and barbed wire numbers are coming straight from Tractor Supply, which is a big box store that, that a lot of people buy products from. Labor to install it, um, in my area, labor, to install any type of fence roughly is anywhere from $1.30 to $1.65 depending on what contractor you use, what materials you're using. Some contractors add a little more. Some con Do we have any contractors in here today? None? Okay. Some, some contractors charge to build brace assemblies. So this number may be uh, not 100% accurate, but it's very close, I feel like. We're just going to leave it at $1.50. Uh, for, for all the comparisons, so $1,500. So total cost in a 1,000 foot 
of a five-strand, low-carbon barbed wire fence is going to be $2,465. So remember that. We're going to come back to it. All right, what does it cost to put in a low-carbon hinge joint fence with one strand of barbed wire on top? We're using the same prices. Um, the, the material was priced at the same store here. So four brace assemblies, just like with the low tensile barbed wire, roughly $200. Same, same amount of T-posts, roughly $400. Uh, four rolls of hinge joint, they had it uh, maybe on a special or that might have been the price all the time, $149.99, so about $600. There's your roll of barbed wire to go on top, and then your labor we left the same. $2,770. So it costs a little more to put up a low-carbon hinge joint fence than it does a low-carbon barbed wire fence. All right, now, this is a high-tensile fixed knot fence like uh, you'll see installed today. Um, two brace assemblies. So you've cut your brace material in half. You've cut your labor in half right there. 65 T-posts versus 100. You've cut your T-posts way back. Um, four rolls of wire. This is a, a very common cattle fence, probably the most economical cattle uh, wire pattern that, that we offer. 8, 42, 12, 42 inches tall, eight horizontal lines. Uh, works very good for perimeter fences. Um, Going to be probably your most common perimeter fence type. Um, and that's coming from a dealer. That could be anywhere from $140 to $150. Uh, two different dealers of mine had it at those prices, so I just kind of met in the middle at $145 a roll. And then one roll of high tensile 15 and a half gauge bob wire. 15 and a half gauge bob wire is going to be a little smaller diameter than, than the 12 and a half gauge low carbon wire, but it's going to have a higher breaking strength. Um, $39 roll. That comes from the same dealer that would have the the 84212 fixed knot. Labor, I left the same $1.50, so it's, I left the labor the same. So as you can see right here, $2,485. So for $20 more, using these numbers that came straight from big box stores that anybody can go to in any town, for $20 more, you can go from having a low carbon, five strand barbed wire fence that everybody in the country put up 30 years ago to a top of the line, new day high tensile fixed knot fence with a strand of barbed wire on top of it and you could put electric on top or something different but just for the comparison so when you really put it into perspective like that it it shows if even though the wire may cost a little more which in this case the wire didn't cost any more it was actually cheaper but in but in some cases the you know the the low carbon wire you can buy cheaper than than high tensile wire but the money you save on materials and and labor is is going to sometimes even be cheaper than low carbon wire. So a lot of times you have to look at every aspect of installing the fence before you make your decision. This is a machine here in Houston just making the fixed knot fence here. Y'all are pretty far away from the screen, but we'll go over it more in the field uh, and, and we'll kind of discuss the differences in, in a fixed knot design instead of a hinge joint design. There's some really big advantages there. That's why it was created in the deer fields. As you can imagine, deer are very hard to keep in a fence. They're very hard on the fence. So they created this fixed knot design and uh, we'll, you'll get to see it hands on in the field. All right, these are some pictures. Um, this is actually an airport in New Brunswick, and this is a contractor that was doing some work close to me last year in the mud. Um, these pictures, uh, somebody sent, added it to our Facebook page. That kind of shows you the strength of a fixed knot fence. That's actually the exact wire that we're putting up today. His skid steer got away from him in the mud, slid down through there. It did break the wood post off, but as you can tell, it stopped his skid steer. So, you know, a seven, 8,000 pound skid steer ran into the fence and may have dented up some wires, but, but it contained it. So big difference in high tensile wire and low carbon wire. Uh, also, with a fixed knot design, as we'll go over in the field, it has a solid stay wire from the top to the bottom instead of a separate wire every uh, connecting every horizontal line. What that does is it helps it stand up on its own and it makes it very easy um, to follow the terrain of the ground, whether you're going up hills, valleys, stuff like that. A uh, hinge joint fence would want to collapse on you right there because it has a hinge in it, hence the name. So. Uh, this is just another picture of a farm. You can tell the, the incline here that we went up. We did put a wood post at the bottom, but you can see the wire standing up, not trying to collapse or anything like that on us. All right, so once you've figured out what wire pattern or wire fabric you, you want to use, what are we going to use 
to put the wire on. Are we going to use wood post? Are we going to use pipe? Um, in this area, pipe sometimes can be hard to find. you got to have a welder and all that. Out west, where these pictures were taken, pipe is used everywhere. But typically around here, you're going to be using um, wooden post. Uh, mostly around here, you're going to be using a pine, uh, pine type of post. This is just some pipe fence here that, that's done with the wires attached to pipe. What to consider when sourcing posts. Today on Mr. Jeff's farm you'll see probably some of the best wooden posts I've seen in a long time. Uh, they, they have a very good treatment, a very good, a very good post. Um, the main thing when, when trying to source your post or determine which post you want to buy, why I should buy this post over the other, is the treatment process. Um, a lot of post manufacturers We'll, we'll cut the tree, peel the bark, and treat it very quickly. They, they don't let the post dry enough before they put it through the treatment process. And what that does is it does not allow the post to absorb the treatment because it still has a bunch of excess moisture in the post. So we want to try to find a post manufacturer that is letting his post air dry for 14 to 21 days at least. Um, the next thing, treatment. A lot of a lot of people you see use six by sixes, dimensional lumber, stuff like that. The reason we do not recommend that and, and want to try to stay away from that is because a, uh, a, a dimensional type of lumber like a six by six, a two by four, anything, even if it's treated, uh, is going to have 0.15 of the copper azole treatment chemical. So. An agricultural treated post, like a fence post that you're going to buy at a farm store or a fence supply store, is going to have an agriculture amount of treatment, which is more than double the amount that a traditional um, dimensional piece of lumber has. A dimensional lumber has what, what they call a residential amount of treatment, and a post is going to have a uh, agriculture amount of treatment. A, a post is going to have 0.4 or so uh, of, the, of the copper arsenic. Um, although they do have over double the amount of treatment, they are just labeled for ground contact. They're, they're, they still don't do good through the middle of a pond or standing water. So, But we do want to try to stay away from dimensional lumber with that residential amount of treatment. Um, Yeah, they use a little bit different chemical, but the main difference is the amount of the chemical that is um, put on the product. Uh, we kind of went over this, uh, the, the, treat, the pressure treating process. Uh, what, a, what a post manufacturer is going to do, hopefully, is let the post dry for several weeks. Then they're going to put it into a, a, a pressure chamber, and they're going to pressurize that chamber to about 180 PSI, pushing the chemical into the post. Uh, finally, they'll, the vacuum will empty and the cylinder will empty and, and pull the post out. So that, that's where if, if they put the post in the treatment process too quick and there's still lots of excess moisture, you can't get as much chemical into the post. Uh, we want to try to buy a post that's treated all the way to the core. That doesn't always happen, uh, but, but that's what we're shooting for. We, we want to be able to, to buy a post that's treated all the way to the center. All right, what post length and sizes do we need? This is a question we get used to, uh, or asked a lot. There's all kind of different sizes of post. Which one do I need to use? As you'll see today, the corners in a fence are the foundation of the fence. If you, if you don't do the corners right, you don't take the time, buy the right material, and install the corners properly, all the rest of the work that you do throughout the fence will be a failure. So, in our corners... I'm going to go to that first. We want to try to stay at least a six inch diameter post or bigger. Um, on the farm you'll see today we use six to seven inch post, uh, most of those being closer to the seven to seven and a half inch range. Eight foot long. We want to go eight foot long, no, no shorter than eight foot on our corner uh, post and our brace assemblies. Uh, if you have to save a little money somewhere, save it in your line post, do not save it in your corners. As you'll see today when we install the fixed knot or the electric wire, that wire will be standing up and the fence will be up and it will never even be attached to the line post until we get ready for it to be. The line post is simply there to hold the wire at the right height off the ground 
and and take a little pressure, but but it's not designed you know to take the pressure that the corner posts are going to take. So in your line post, we want to try to stay at least a four inch. We typically like to use a four to five or a five to six. Um, you can get away with a little bit shorter post here. A seven foot post in some cases is is not a big issue. Um, that's uh, we're going to drive you know drive a line post or something like that anyway so you can save a little bit of money if you have to in your line post with a little smaller diameter and a little shorter length. Um, a lot of posts or most posts in this area are going to have a little bit of a taper so when we say six to seven four to five that is a um, an estimate in that bundle of posts there may be one that's that's four on each end. There may be one that's closer to five. Uh, as you know, a tree grows, it's bigger at the base than it is at the top. And we're taking trees and making posts out of them, so they will have a little bit of a taper. So when you buy post, that's kind of how you're going to have to buy them probably in this area. is going to be a range, five to six, six to seven, stuff like that. Uh, common lengths are seven, eight, and ten. We want to try to use some ten-foot horizontal brace rails and we'll go over that in greater detail in the field and tell you why and, and show you why and stuff like that. Um, also, you can on this, this taper, you can buy what they call perfect post or a turned post. A lot of farm stores and big box stores carry a turned type post. The problem with a turn type post, even though it is an agriculture post and it has the agriculture amount of treatment, is when you put a piece of lumber in a lathe and you make it perfect, what are you doing? You're taking meat off of that. So um, it will be perfectly straight today and it will look beautiful. You drive it in the ground, two or three months later you come back, it's going to look like this. It will be bowed or crooked. When you take meat off of a piece of lumber, um, it, it, it's going to take a big chance on warping because it, it may be bigger on one side or, or the other of the core of it. So we don't we want to stay away from perfect or turned type posts. We want to use a peeled post, which is what we used yesterday. That simply means they peeled the bark off of it, left it just in its natural state, and treated it. So if a if you used a peeled post and it does have a little bit of a crook in it, which there was a few yesterday, you probably won't be able to tell today because when you drive that post, you can take that crook or bend or imperfection into consideration when driving it and you can allow for that and when you're done, it'll be and look straight. Um, whereas if you buy a perfect post and you drive them straight, they will end up crooked 99% of the time. So we want to use a peeled post and not a turned post. We want to stay away from dimensional lumber. That's a landscaping timber there at a farm that I took a picture of lasted, I don't even know if that's two years old. Landscaping timbers are dimensional lumber. A lot of them aren't even treated, so don't use landscaping timbers, four by four, stuff like that. Uh, we also don't want to use decorative posts. Any kind of decorative post that you can buy at a, at a Lowe's or a, or a farm store, anything like that, typically are going to be um, more in the residential treatment amount. So they're, they're not going to have as much treatment as a true agricultural treated post. So don't, don't use decorative type posts for your fence installation. Alright, so we've bought all, all of our material. Now we're ready to begin. So... If possible, we're going to try to drive our post. Um, if you do not have a post driver, um, try to get in contact with somebody that does or hire somebody. If you're going to install a fence, the best money that you'll spend, take the money you're saving by installing it yourself, pay somebody to drive the post. A driven post is going to be nine to ten times stronger than a dug post. As you'll see today, we drove all those posts yesterday at lunch and we're going to put the fence up today. Uh, if you fenced with your grandpa 50 years ago, you dug a hole and you tamped it and you came back three weeks later and put the fence on it. Not today. We're going to drive all the posts if possible. Um, you can drive with this driver here. You'll see today you can drive anything from a three or four inch post up to those. that post there was probably eight or ten inches, a big post. So we want to try to drive our post if possible. Try for perfection. This, this is, these are actually pictures we took with a drone yesterday afternoon, so y'all are getting to see firsthand exactly what we're going to see today. We drove those posts. Uh, we had one guy kind of backsiding them, and uh, that, that was me there driving. As you can tell, they're, they're, they may not be perfect, but they're very, very close. We, uh, it was a good, good, good post, good ground, and it, it turned out really good. So take your time. Try for perfection. 
This is a picture here of the drone. You can see we, you know, they are they ended up very nice in a very straight line. A lot of people say, "Oh, you can't drive posts in a straight line." You can once you get the hang of it and you take your time. So, all right, here's the big thing that you run into in Kentucky that everybody wants to know: Am I supposed to drive my post level or am I supposed to drive my post perpendicular with the ground? This is a big thing that some people may disagree with me on. They may not like the way it looks, but far as Stay Tough is concerned, far as Gallagher is concerned, any wire manufacturer, if they have much to say, we want to try to keep the post perpendicular with the ground. The reason for that is that's how the wire is going to run down the ground. We want to keep the post parallel with the vertical stays in the fence. That way there's equal pressure on each of the lines. There's not more pressure on the bottom than the top. It flows with the ground and everything is smooth and has equal pressure. As you can tell here, that would have been the post if we had a drove it level. You can see how it crosses over three different squares. That's not what we want. We want to try to drive the post perpendicular with the ground to keep it running with the flow of the wire, the same way the cattle or, or goats or animals are walking down the wire. Also, in some places in Kentucky, it's so steep that you wouldn't have a tall enough post. You'd run out of post before you could get it nailed up. So try to keep your post perpendicular with the ground. I know that may be new to some people and they may disagree with it, but I think once you see it and understand why we do that, it, 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 it is definitely a better option. Here's just another picture of, you can see how steep that, that place there was. All right, so now we've drove our post, uh, our corners. Um, this is what we talked about on our line post, big money saving here. You can, like that place there is very flat. Where we're going today is very flat. We could have put our post spacing probably 20, 25 foot. Also, we don't need a brace, but every 1,300 foot. Um, so, so big, big material savings there. H braces. I'll touch a little bit on it here, but we'll spend most of the time talking about braces in the field where you can be hands-on and see it. It'll make a whole lot more sense then. We, as wire manufacturers, recommend a single H brace assembly in your corners um, for, one, for one main reason. Uh, we want to use a horizontal brace rail two and a half times the height of the fence. The reasoning for this is we want to try to keep this brace wire angle around 30 degrees. If you get it, if you take a short brace rail, you're increasing the angle of the brace wire and it's going to be pulling up on your post instead of pushing against it. And like I said, in the field, we'll, we'll do a little more hands-on and it'll make more sense. But you see a lot of guys take an eight-foot post or, or something like that, cut it in half, make two brace rails. That will not work. Um, we're going to put a... a extreme amount of pressure on these braces today when we tension all that wire and I think a lot of people don't understand the, 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 the pressure that you're going to put on this corner post here. So we want to use a, a brace rail if possible two and a half times the height of the fence. So if you're putting up a 48 inch fence you want a 10 foot brace rail. Um, that's what we use today. We used pipe. We'll use pipe today. Schedule 40, 2 and 7 eighths pipe. Uh, makes a very good brace. You can use a 4-inch, 10-foot um, wooden brace rail if possible. 10-foot wooden posts get hard to find sometimes. But um, this is should be in your book. This is just a, a stay tough uh, this kind of guide here in material list. Our, our wire is going to be a 20 to 30-year wire, and it will come with a warranty. On the back of the label, you'll see... Um, you can fill it out, turn it in. This is the big issue that we run into if we ever do have a warranty call. Somebody installed our wire and didn't build braces properly and then something happened to their wire or it got loose or whatever. So if you turn in, you know, if you buy some of our product, you turn in the warranty and you call me and say, boy, my fence is it's not right, something's wrong with it. This first thing I'm going to come look at at your farm is your brace assemblies. If they're not built properly, it can void your warranty. So we really want to focus on the braces and take a lot of time to do that correctly. That's just another picture there. Inline braces. This is a big deal if you're hiring your fence done that contractors make the mistake of doing a lot of times. A lot of times you'll see a contractor put a single H brace in line. There is no correct way to install a two post brace in line and, and make it work to pull in both directions like it has to do. So, 
we want to use a three post inline brace and we'll go over this more in the field like I say you'll see it and it'll make more sense but if an inline brace if you don't stop and terminate to it at each separate pull then the inline brace is doing absolutely no good if they put a single H brace in like this and your contractor pulls past it and nails it to the post that is doing nothing more than an inline just a line post so what they've done is they spent your money with all these materials and labor for nothing uh, so we want to try to stay away from that. We want to use a three post inline brace. The reason for that is we want to terminate to this center post. So if I'm pulling from the left to the right, tie it off and terminate it at this post. Then I start again, terminate it there and pull from the left to the right again. So the center post is taking the pressure from both pulls. The only way to keep that post like that is to have a brace on each side of it with your twitch wires um, assembled in a way that is pushing on this post in the opposite direction of the wire. So as you can see in this, there's no way to do it. If we tie it here and pull this way, yes, it's correct, but how do we keep it uh, braced when we're pulling it from, when it's pulling back this way, when we attach our wire and it's pulling back this way? There's no way. So if, you, if your contractor is installing braces like this in line, uh, that needs to be addressed and fixed. That, that is not proper in line brace. We want to stay with a three post in line brace. That's some pipe braces. We're not going to go into detail there. We're not building any pipe braces. Double H braces. This is another thing that a lot of contractors do. And if you are a contractor, I'm not picking on you. We're just trying to kind of make sure everybody knows the pros and cons of some of this stuff. We do not recommend a double brace. Double braces are fine. If you build fence every day and you drive post every day and you're very good at it. If you're not, like me, I'm not a professional fencer. I don't drive post every day. I, we do not recommend a double brace at a corner or an end like this. If you do not get this center post 100% correct, you've created a hinge there. So when you put pressure on that and it hinges, it's going to fail. Uh, if this post is out of line at all, if the brace rail is pinned out of line just a little, you've created a hinge right there and your brace is going to fail and the rest of your fence is going to fail. Uh, we have done studies at our training facility experimental station in Texas. A, a single H brace with a brace rail two and a half times the height of the fence will hold more pressure than a double H brace with two seven or eight foot brace rails. Um, the shorter these are, the steeper your wire is, so you're pulling up on the post instead of pushing on it. Also, like I said, if that's not done correct, you've created a hinge. And then the third reason, you have double the material for no reason. There's no need for double the material here. So that's another thing to look at. If you're hiring your fence done and they want to put double braces everywhere, it needs to be addressed. No need to have double braces. <clears throat> All right, so now we've driven all our posts, we've built our braces, we're going to roll our wire out. Today you'll see we're, we're going to pull from the center. Um, you can pull to one end, we'll go over that in the, in, the, in the field. But today I think I'm going to pull in the center just so everybody can see how it's done. Uh, with a 300 foot stretch, it, it's pretty simple. I can make it where you probably won't ever notice that we pulled it in the center. The reason we pull it in the center, which is probably something that you've never seen done, and most people go, why in the world would you do that? Is because you can pull up to 1,320 foot. Um, traditionally, you're going to have to pull it every 330 foot. So everybody put a stretcher bar in here and pulled it to, to the brace and tied it off and went again. Not, not with a high tensile type fence. You can pull every four rolls, every 1,320 feet. You're going to pull out about a percent of the wire. So the reason for pulling in the center, if we pulled to one end, we would have to have chains and, and come-alongs that were so long, you would never be able to get it tight. So by putting two bars in it, you've cut the distance that you have to pull that wire in half. Each bar only has to pull half the distance it, it would have to if you just had one. On shorter stretches, uh, pulling with one bar is, is fine and I'll kind of show you how we would do that today. Uh, the main thing is we don't ever want to pull our wire past and staple off hard to our corners. You see that a lot. Uh, that is a probably the number one thing that some contractors do. 
uh, that that is wrong. We we don't we always want to terminate and not pull past and make our staples hold it. But we'll go over that in the field. But today we're going to pull in the center with these bars, chain pullers, just like you see here, um, and and it'll make more sense. This is a picture here of where we've spliced it. This is six inch stay, and as you can tell here, when we spliced it, we kept the square six inches. So hopefully we will do that today. You you'll never know where it was even spliced. Um, what little bit of slack here in between these bars is it absorbed over the whole fence and you'll see today that wire will stand right up and be banjo tight and and it won't have a staple in it anywhere so kind of a learning thing today if you hadn't seen this done it, it will be pretty interesting splice it and go we'll use splices we'll show you those in the field we'll show you the differences in splices uh, the differences in pinwheels and some other things Fix knot and electric make great combinations. I'm not going to get into that. That's Jeremy's area there. But as you can see here, we've we've built a fixed knot fence and we've put an offset bracket on it. A um, hundred options to do from here if you, if you know if you have a hot wire like that. All right. In summary, uh, the big thing that that I'm going to stress on, Jeremy's going to stress on, the post driver guys are going to stress on. Take the time, lay it out, plan it out, draw it on a napkin, on a piece of paper. Uh, use flags, use paint. Don't just go out there and say, I'm going to build a fence here. Because I guarantee you, if you do that, you'll come back in a month and go, boy, I wish I had done it different. And uh, it's, it's very difficult, aggravating, and uh, costly to have to redo stuff. So take into consideration where your gates have to be, where your waters have to be. How am I going to drive the cattle into here? Or how am I going to drive the goats into here? Um, Build good, solid braces. Do not skimp on your brace assemblies. If you have to skimp anywhere in the fence, I'm a farmer just like all y'all are. I want to save money where I can just like everybody else. Save your money in your line post or something like that. Don't skimp on the braces. Build good, solid braces. Uh, install fence properly using correct method and tools. We're going to go over that in the field today. You'll see some uh, ways that you might not have ever seen to build a brace or, or to fasten wire to a post, stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, if you buy the correct material and install it properly, you'll get to enjoy a low maintenance fence for a long time. You won't have to go back and do it. And that's what I think we're all shooting for. We want to fence one time and be done with it uh, and never have to come back to it. Because on the farm, the fence is the only tool that you have that works 24-7. So, you know, you've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on tractors. Why not take a little time and extra money and spend it on the fence because it is the only thing that's working for you all the time, day and night. Any questions? Yes. Uh -huh. That's right. Yeah, we, we typically do, and we'll go over that in the field today. We, we typically want to keep the wire in between the animal and the post. Um, big thing in the high tensile industry is, is line post spacing. I had a guy come up to me at Louisville at the farm show this year and said, oh, I went to y'all's school, and that crap about the line post spacing, that, that's, that's, that's a lie. He said, my cows are pushing my fence down. I said, well, all right, let's, let's go over and see what the issue is. Well, he had put the wire on the outside of the post and didn't have – a hot wire anything on the inside and so yes the staple was having to do all the work and they were pushing it down so we want to try to keep the wire in between the animal and the post today it's going to be on the outside and we'll go over some reasons of why we're doing it like that there and if you're doing it for hire a lot of people want it done like that for looks and stuff like that so if you do have to do that we want to try to run an offset or something on the inside to keep them from pushing on it uh, if you can talk them out of doing that, um, that would be better. We, we want to always try to keep the wire in between the animal and the post where they're pushing against the post, if anything. Uh, hot wire will definitely uh, keep them off from rubbing and pushing on the fence, so, so an offset is always a, a great option.